Uh, I was given an assignment, actually. I was told to discuss about an irrational belief in the divinity of the Torah. Uh, I'm going to address that uh, with your permission, but uh, first, I have always wondered, this goes back really to my bar mitzvah, <coughs> uh, where I really face the question of who wrote that Chumash. You know, there's the five books of Moses. Somebody wrote it, that's for sure. Now, either a human being wrote it, or God wrote it, one or the other. Again, for certain. Well, let's say a human being wrote it. Who was he? Was he a Jew? Very clearly not. There is no way in the world that anybody could possibly believe that a Jew wrote that book. Because if a Jew would have written that book, he would have found something, something somewhere nice to be able to say about the Jewish people. <laughs> that book doesn't have a nice word for anyone who is a Jew. No one. Whether it is Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, they're fooled or they make mistakes or they fool people. They are either not smart or they are too smart. And they're talking about the Shvatim, are they those who formed the tribes of Israel, sold the brother into slavery, full of jealousy, worried them. Our ancestors slaves and loved their slavery and kept saying, we want to go back and be slaves. Who couldn't be trained for anything? A constant, unceasing, ever-going story of mishaps, of wrongness, of miscalculation, of wrong-headedness, of, if I can say it, God forbid, stupidity, obtuseness, somewhere, somewhere, <laughs> I can think of one. They did say to God, not some initial. That's the one nice thing. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of the Bible, one nice thing. But I want to tell you something. You think that after the Chumash, at least they get back into the land, to writing the story of their history, <coughs> somewhere after they got through the land, and they built a country, and they built a base of Mikdash, and they had their own kings and institutions, that maybe somebody would slip a kind word in then, nothing done. Nothing doing. A constant series of evil, wrongness, lack of gratitude, rebelliousness of the heroes, David, King of Israel, full of wrong, Solomon, full of wrong. Somebody, somewhere, sometime, to do something nice. Even the self-haters who've been writing American history lately find somebody they can pray. And mind you, all this written in a time when there was no such thing as I and my people or my country ever did anything wrong. If you read Egyptian history, they never lost the war. If you read Babylonian history, they never lost the war. They are only a category of success, of brilliance, the bad things they leave for the Egyptians to write about them. And if you want to find out something where the Egyptians failed, you've got to read Assyrian history. <clears throat> because the Egyptians never put down something bad about Egypt or the 
any one of the other countries about themselves. Today, with our vaunted scientific history, you still have a rough time finding the truth about your own country. It's a psychological impossibility, you know that very well, that a Jew would have written the Chumash. Which means that either God wrote it, or a vicious anti-Semite wrote the Chumash. One or the other, for sure. But the remarkable thing is that this Hitler, who wrote the Chumash, persuaded the Jews to accept him. That is an even more remarkable miracle. So we've got to face up to the fact that if the Chumash was not written by God, there are some extraordinary miracles that brought it into existence. But if we want to deal with it honestly, we have to face a peculiar fact. When we look at all of history of all the peoples of the world, you will discover a peculiar reality. There is no such thing as a unique story. There is no such thing. If you have a fairy tale told in South America, the equivalent fairy tale is told by the Eskimos. And if you have a story of poor Cinderella, that Cinderella is to be found in India, and that Cinderella is to be found in Africa, the name changes, yes. But the concept is always there. There is no story that doesn't have its counterpart elsewhere in the annals of mankind. There are no uniquenesses except for two. The Jews are unique and the Greeks are unique. Greece is unique. An outpouring, a wealth of magnificence, of mind, of beauty, and that has never been duplicated, was never seen before in the same sense. An intense, incredible richness that flourished for centuries in a way that affected the reality of all mankind in all the centuries that followed. A uniqueness. And the Jew is unique. There are no other uniquenesses in all the annals of mankind. But look at the difference. The Greek was unique for his centuries and passed out of the ken of mankind. The Jew was unique and remains unique and is unique to this day and was unique forever. And not simply in one aspect, but in every aspect of his existence. You're going to have to explain that away. This incredible uniqueness. And I'm going to deal with periphery uniquenesses first before we come to deal with the central uniqueness that is the Jew. We have a vaunted educational system here in the United States. How old is it? How old is it? It's less than two centuries that we have the concept that tax money, money taken from the population as a whole should be used to give an education to its children. It's only 200 years old. But do you know something? It's 2,500 years old with us Jews. We Jews have had a tax-supported education system for the past 2,500 years. Isn't it fantastic? The Jew, 2,500 years, and the non-Jew, two centuries. 2,500 years. We have understood the, the absolute necessity of providing, by public funds, an educational institution for our children and mankind as a whole. Took another 2,300 years before they discovered this truth. 
You know, there is a very remarkable fact for which I can offer you a theory. I don't know that this is true, but it is a theory that I would offer you for your consideration, and in doing so, meanwhile, bring to your attention an incredible uniqueness that belongs to the Jew. You know, there is an introdabia. In Cunablia are all of those books that were printed before the year 1500. And among the Gentiles, among the general population of mankind, in Cunablia, books printed before the year 1500 are in the tens of thousands. When the printing, the Gutenberg print became <coughs> into existence, there was an outpouring of publication by the thousands of all kinds of books. By the thousands, tens of thousands, they published books. An outburst of publication. And the Jews published almost nothing. Jewish Ipanavia consists of several hundred. And we are the people of the book. <coughs> We did not have a Talmud published till many, many years after printing came into me. And then it was a Gentile firm that published the Talmud and the Rambam. And by the way, they lost money on it. <laughs> and it always puzzled me. Today, in Israel, they publish proportionately Ten times as much as any other country in the world. Jewish publication is an incredible business. In America, Svahim, Jewish textbooks are published by the hundreds of thousands for a very small segment of the population. The number of Jewish bookstores are in the hundreds. There probably are as many Jewish bookstores as there are all other bookstores combined throughout the land, throughout the United States. And yet, when the printing began, there were no Jewish books printed. What happened? I have a theory. It makes sense to me. I think what happened was as follows. You see, among the non-Jews, they never read. They had no books. They didn't know how to read. When printing began, it was an opportunity that had never been present before. They suddenly had the chance to have books in their home to learn how to read. And so they printed by the thousands and thousands among Jews before print when a book required the enormous investment in time and effort on the part of a scribe of years of writing, they had tens of thousands of books. Every Jewish home had its sitter. Every Jewish home had its chumash. Every Jewish home had its rashi. How many Jewish homes had its rambam? When they birthed the Talmud, in Paris, and in Rome, and in Naples, they burnt them by the hundreds of wagon loads. More books than the libraries of Paris and Rome possessed. They burnt just tomes of the Talmud in one day by the hundreds of wagon loads. When each one of these volumes had to be written by hand by a scribe who had to spend years and doing so when they had them in all the Jewish homes, in all Jewish synagogues, they had copies of this incredibly complex and large Shas, the Talmud. And so, when printing came about, there was no great need. They had the books in their homes. It was only gradually as these were worn out that the need to buy new ones, they suddenly discovered it's so much easier and cheaper to get a printed one. But for the first 
couple of hundred years they still use the manuscripts which they had in the hundreds of thousands. Tell me something. Is that unique? Is that unique that one people, of all the peoples of mankind, one, out of all the nations, all the nations, all over the world, one and only one, were universally literate and had books in the hundreds available to all their children for them to live with, to learn, to deal with, is that unique? Does that uniqueness require some explanation? Does that uniqueness inspire some wonder? How did this come about? This incredible, unbelievable uniqueness that of all the peoples of mankind, one and only one people had universal literacy and the tens of thousands of books laboriously produced with enormous effort to be spread wherever there was a Jewish community. They all had these hundreds and thousands of books. A unique, <coughs> an unbelievable uniqueness, but a uniqueness that represents another uniqueness that is almost impossible to be able to explain. Mankind has engendered many religions. In the hundreds of thousands of religions, you take an encyclopedia of religions, and in very small print, you have literally hundreds of thousands of different religions. And every one of those hundreds of thousands of different religions have one thing in common. And the thing they have in common is thou shalt not think. Thou shalt not read. Thou shalt not study. If you want to find out, ask the priest. And you know what they said to the priest? They said, don't get too smart. If you want to find out, ask the bishop. There's only one, one only in all the animals of mankind's religion <coughs> that says, think, study, know, be learned. <coughs> it is a religious obligation to study and to learn, and to know, and to think. And what does it mean when you're told that it is a religious obligation to study and to think? You know what it says? It says, my dear children, when I gave you a religion, it wasn't to be automatic, it so was for you to make decisions. It was for you to become responsible, it was for you to take upon yourself the burden of knowing what to do and how to do and why to do, of understanding the sources of your beliefs and your activities. That's what it means when you have an obligation to study and to learn and to think. And what does it mean when they so oh, don't think it's because, come on, just take it on blind faith. Now here we come to the deepest, the most profound of all the uniquenesses that belongs to the Jew and to the Jew alone. For, and I hesitate to say this because I know how offensive it is to an American, all religions are necessarily false. And I'll tell you why. Because all religions depend on a leap of faith. Without a leap of faith, you cannot be a Christian. Without a leap of faith, you cannot be a Muslim. Without a leap of faith, you cannot be a Buddhist. Without a leap of faith, you cannot be a Mormon. Without a leap of faith, you cannot be a Christian scientist. 
You've got to make a leap of faith. You've got to say, I believe. I believe Mary Baker Eddy when she told me that standing on the hill God appeared to her with the key to the scriptures. I've got to believe Joseph Smith when he comes and says that the angel Veroni came and did with the Book of Mormon. You've got to believe. Why should you believe? Believe! Let your heart open up and take in the land. you got to believe. Why should I believe? you got to believe. Why should I believe? Because your heart tells you. Your heart tells you. Do you know of anything that a human heart won't tell him? <laughs> whether to kill or whether to love, whether to destroy or whether to build, everything the human heart tells. <coughs> a leap of faith. Where do you leap when you leap? For faith, you leap into the fire or the fire pan, one or the other. But the one thing for sure you don't leap into and that is a source of life. All religions require a leap of faith. Because all religions are built on the teachings of man. You cannot believe man without a leap of faith. When he tells you God has spoken to me and revealed to me his will and his desires and his teachings, you got to say, <coughs> but prophet mine, how do we know that God spoke to you? How can we tell? <coughs> believe your heart. Open your heart and believe that God spoke to me. Dear Mohammed, you're a wonderful man. How do we know God spoke to you? I'm telling you, I myself am openly testifying to the fact that God spoke to me. Dear Mohammed, Maybe you're not telling the truth. Or maybe you've had an illusion. Or maybe, why in the world should I believe you because you tell it to me? Do you believe Bush because he tells it to you? There's only one religion. <coughs> only one religion. One and no other in all the history of mankind. One and only one. Where you don't have to believe the prophet that he's a prophet. Where God spoke to the people as a whole and told them, Moses is my prophet. No shit. Doesn't come and say, believe me, God sent me. They'll say to him, crazy? Why would we believe you? They didn't. And you know something funny? This Chumash was written 3,000 years ago, everybody agreed. 3,000 years ago, everybody knew that miracles occurred. 3,000 years ago, everybody knew that the prophet came and said, I'm a prophet, you believe him, especially if he can perform a trick, or two, or three. The said, no. No, no. Miracles are no reason to believe in prophecy. No, no. Miracles prove nothing. Do you believe that? The Chumash said, miracles produce and prove nothing. You don't believe because of a miracle. You never know what is a miracle, what isn't a miracle. Miracles are really the way you look at things and what you want to believe. You want me to show you that? Tell me something. Was it a miracle that the Jews survived in 1973? Or was it a miracle? You say, well, no, what was a miracle? It's a very simple thing. What were the probabilities of their surviving? One in 50,000. That's a miracle. You don't want to believe a miracle, it's not a miracle. You want to believe a miracle, it's a miracle. Miracles prove nothing. That's what I'm saying. How are you going to know? The woman says, do you know how we Jews are going to know that Moshe is a prophet of God? God, 
And they will hear as I pronounce to proclaim you begam v'cha ya'aminu li'olam and only then will the Jews know that Moshe is truly a prophet of God because they heard God himself tell them that Moshe is truly a prophet and that the words that he utters are the words that are put into his mouth by God himself. That is why we accept the law from Moshe. We don't believe him. We don't say he was such a marvelous man, such a wonderful man, and he performed such tremendous miracles and he took us out of Egypt and he set us free. Therefore, we'll believe in him, nothing of the sort. We won't believe a word he says until God told us, not him, but us, this man is my prophet, and the words he utters to you are the words that I put into his mouth. And therefore, what he says, you should accept. <coughs> and only then, only then, did the Jews accept Moshe as truly being God's prophet. <coughs> and I want to tell you something. This is the greatest of all the miracles, because of all other peoples believe anybody who performs a trick or two. What you have to do is pull off a miracle and you're set for life. But not among the Jews. A uniqueness. But tell me something. <clears throat> it's an obvious advantage to be able to say God himself appeared and said that Muhammad is a prophet. Why don't they tell that story? Why don't they tell the story that God himself appeared and said, Jesus is my son? Why don't they tell that story? Could it be because there's no way to make up such a story? That the telling of the story is bearing witness to its falseness? What do you mean God said it? Who heard it? Everybody heard it. Everybody heard it. My parents never heard it. <laughs> My neighbors never heard it. How can you say that everybody heard it? Well, they weren't there. Wouldn't you just that everybody heard it? You can't tell such a story. If you could, don't you believe they would? You don't believe that they would have told this story dozens and dozens and dozens of different times? Why not? If I can say, God himself told you that I am a prophet, why do I have to get you to lie on my testimony? It's obvious an advantage to say, God is saying I'm his prophet. If you could get away with such a story, you don't think it would have been composed and told more than once? Why is it told once and once only and the only unique story that mankind possesses? Mankind has no other unique story, only one. And the one unique story is that God appeared to the entire nation of Israel. And in the presence of every one of them, proclaimed the reality of Moshe as a true prophet. And that the words he utters are the words that God will put into his mouth. And the Chumash says more, God offered to speak to all the people his law. But they couldn't. It was too much. It was a burning reality, God's presence. And who could stand up and tolerate the incredible pressure that it is to be in God's own presence? And so they turned to God and said, please, let Moshe be your representative, your messenger to us. We cannot bear to personally hear your words. And God said, okay, Moshe will be my prophet, and I will send my message to you through him. What other story, what other people can tell this and do this? You've got to explain it away. You've got to explain away the rather remarkable phenomena that in all the nations of the world, because mind you, 
None of them are going to lie to their children. Well, the Christian tells his child the truth. The Muslim tells his child the truth. They all tell the truth. And what is it that the Christian says to his child? The English Christian says to his child, My son, your father and grandfather and great-grandfather were pagans who painted themselves blue and danced around the trees. When there came a man from across the sea and bore the wonderful message that Jesus was the Son of God. And they believed him. And so they became Christian. Why did they believe him? They believed him. He doesn't tell them a story that they could prove it or show it or tell it. He tells them the truth. They tell their children the truth. This man persuaded them. And then he says, well, would they have been persuaded if it wasn't true? What do you think? Would they have been persuaded if it wasn't true? Are there a very few untruths that people have been persuaded to swallow? The Mohammedan tells his child the truth that the Mohammed came forth with the word of God. And he told all the people the word of God. And lo and behold, there were those who followed him. And lo and behold, there were those who did not accept this message. Lo and behold, the followers of Mohammed did smite with the sword of those who did not believe him. And he won the war. And he said to the conquered people after having executed all of their priests and leaders, he said, will you accept that Allah is God that Mohammed is his prophet or what? Well, yes. Wonderful, it's not off with the head. And I know how surprised you are that they all said, yes, Allah is God and Mohammed is his prophet and kept their head intact. This is Mohammedan history. It is not my hyperbole. It's them. And the proof of Mohammed's truth is that he won the war. But the Christians won the war. And the Mongols won the war. And the Chinese won the war. Are they all wrong? A leap of faith. The Jew said, no leap of faith. The Jew said, we are Jews because we encounter God. We are Jews because the story we tell is impossible to be made up. It's got to be true, or it could not be told. That's why we are Jews. Search, think, examine. Who else can say that? To search, to think, to examine the roots of Christianity, Mohammedism, Buddhism, any of them, is necessarily to reject. To search, to examine, to think of Judaism is to see truth. A uniqueness that those who would not accept must explain away. They've got to find some way to explain this incredible uniqueness. But it's a beginning. It's a beginning. <coughs> All religions are man made, with one exception at the most. This we all must agree. If there is a true religion, there is one religion given by God, all others given by man. If there's no true religion, all religions are made by man, right? So what is a man-made religion for sure going to represent? And the one thing you know it's going to do is it's going to be practical. That is to say, there is no way that a man-made religion will have the following law. Every seven years, I want you to starve yourself and your family to death. <laughs> a man-made religion just can't say that. I mean, 
things are going to be too funny for her. <laughs> no matter what leap of faith you make, they're not going to do that one. But the Jewish religion, our Jewish does exactly that. Every seven years, don't plant, don't go. Not sit at home and study and think and learn and discuss. No work. You hear that? But no no, we got children out there. They get hungry. What can we feed them? Don't worry. Don't you worry. I'll give you in advance enough food that you'll have for all the years you're not working as well. Be stored up in advance so that you'll be able to sit and study that seventh year without work. Come on, son. Who says that? Who talks like that? Does a human being make up that kind of a law? Is it acceptable, is it reasonable that a human being will tell a whole people, a whole nation, every seventh year, don't plow, sow, grow, sit home and study? <laughs> is it possible, is it conceivable? But you know, there's another one over there that is really a God says to the Jews three times every year, three times a year, I want you to leave your home and your possessions and come up to Jerusalem, to the base of Mikdash, to greet me, to greet God. Yeah. You know, we're surrounded, the Syrians and the North, and the Jordanians, and the East. Listen, God, if we do that when we come home, there won't be a thing left. They'll wipe us out. They'll destroy and rend that which they can't take with them, and they'll take every movable thing. God, how can you answer to abandon our homes and our possessions three times a year? Surrounded as we are by vicious enemies who are waiting to destroy us. And God says, don't be worried. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. You go up to Jerusalem. When you get back, everything will be in apple pie with us. Nobody will touch a thing. No fires will burn anything. Everything will be perfectly well preserved. Tell me, how many times did he think that would happen? Let's say you can persuade him to do it once. Will you ever get them to do it again? How do you make such a law? How do you tell such a law? Does a human being make up such a law? Does any religion made by humans act that kind of an impossible to carry out law? But the Jews do. Who made it? A human being wrote that. Who wrote it? And how did they not discover how absurd this religion was after the first couple of years when they saw that it was all nonsense? Must have been that they saw that it worked. How did it work? All the nations and their religions have prophets. And what do the prophets prophesy? The prophets prophesy that the conjunction of this and that will be that there'll be prosperity and that don't do this on this day or maybe exactly what happened. You know the oracles in Greece? Remember those oracles in Greece? They never made them. Never. In all the years of Greek history, the articles were as wrong as one. The only trouble was you never knew what they said until after it happened. Mm -hmm. After it happened, oh, that's what they meant. And they could very easily be right all the time when you can write it backwards. They never, ever knew what the article said until after the thing occurred, and then they said, that's what the article meant all along. Now we know what it meant, and sure enough, it happened. But you didn't know in advance what would happen. But let me tell you something that the Kumish did say in advance. You will 
be thrown out of the land, and you will be dispersed among all the nations, and they will oppress you. Listen to this. But you will survive as a people, and you will come back to the land. Who did that time? Think of this absurd statement. You'll be dispersed among all the nations of the world if you preserve your identity. How do you preserve your identity when you're dispersed among all the nations of the world? How does that happen? And how do you make such a prophecy? And I'll bring you back. And you'll be thrown out a second time. And you'll be dispersed once more among all the nations of the world to an evil race degree. But you will retain your identity. <coughs> you will remain a Jewish people. And you will retain the Torah that I have taught you. You will retain it. You won't lose it. Do you hear a prophecy written 3,500 years ago? Do you have that any place else? Does that happen? Who wrote this? A man wrote this. A man thought of this impossible thing that the people will be dispersed to all the corners of the earth. Oppressed, driven, I will survive and keep their Torah with them. Not once, but twice. You'll come back, and you'll rebuild, and you get thrown out again. Who does that? Is that prophecy? Is that something divine? But it's less than divine, not only to foretell it, but that it should happen. How could it be that a people dispersed among all the nations of the world, contemned and despised, oppressed and driven, without a language in common, without a land in common, Without customs in common, without a race in common, different in their looks, the blondes and the brunettes and the blacks and the reds. The whole Jews, recognizing themselves as Jews, standing firm in their Jewishness, and their acceptance of their reality as being part of a people without anything in common. American Jews and Dutch Jews and African Jews and Moroccan Jews and Yemenite Jews, all Jews, looking different, speaking different, thinking different, and all Jews. How did that happen? That not a unique miracle just to happen is an incredible miracle but to have it foretold thousands of years in advance to be told that this is what's going to be and that you'll come back listen to that joke you'll come back and I was speaking to a group of Jews. And we were speaking about Mashiach. And an elderly gentleman got up and he said to me, Rabbi, come on. Do you really believe Mashiach is going to come? That's what he said. And I said to him, you know something I said? If you would have asked me this 50 years ago, I would have had a rough time. But tell me something. 50 years ago, I would have told you that the Jews are coming back to Israel and they're going to be the government of the land and it's going to be a Jewish country again. 
Wouldn't you have said, come on, Rabbi, you don't believe that? Is that the truth? Wouldn't you have said that? Wouldn't you have said that? But it happened. They did come back. They are there. Against the whole world, they are there. Truth. But he's right. How can you believe such nonsense? Other than the fact that it's there. But to tell it 2,000 years in advance, you believe that? Who wrote it? Who thought that? Somebody who was able to tell the unfolding of mankind's history, perhaps? Not divine. Not divine. The human being did that. Not divine. Laws that have transformed the face of humanity. Laws that have taken human beings to who? The ultimate greatness and the ultimate power. The ultimate worthiness. The ultimate hero was the warrior. The most efficient and capable killer. Is this not the common inheritance of all mankind? Is it not the acceptance of all human beings in every clime, in every country, in every place? That to the brave belong the fair? Or that of the powerful arm who knows how to wield the spear and the sword? That the legitimate ruler, the legitimate guide, the legitimate teacher of mankind, except among the Jews. And tell me, in all the long, torturous expression of human history, how much blood was shed, how much suffering occurred until little by little, the Jew was able to teach mankind that it is not the warrior who is the hero, but the thinker, the doer, the creator, the compassionate one, the responsible one. Tell me, did not all of mankind know that if you didn't make it, so oh, I can throw you a little bone here and there, but don't bother me. Who taught mankind the concept of responsibility for my fellow human beings? Who taught it to mankind? How long have they had it? When did they buy it? How much did we have to pay? before we were able to get them to see and recognize that this is truly the mark of a human being. To share the responsibility, not just for ourselves and our own families, but for our brother human beings as well. Was it from anybody else but the Jew that mankind slowly, slowly over the centuries came to recognize and accept this truth, or this enabler of human beings to be human and not animals, is it not the mark of the Jew that this is today finally, finally come to be the common acceptance of mankind? Tell me something. Of all the religions that mankind has produced, has there ever been one that produced two daughters? Two daughters that lifted mankind from the depths and troughs of paganism, or from the lowest of the low of human sacrifice and slaughter of 
immorality and death feeling to the heights of accepting the reality of one God. The reality of a truth and a morality and an ethics that ought to bind the one. What other religion has had offshoots and have so uplifted mankind? Does not the meaningful religions of man, are they not derivative of the one called Judaism? Today, we are, of course, multicultural and we must recognize and that the Far Eastern also have a religion and the Africans have a religion. Come on, that's a religion. That's a religion giving in to the lowest kind of mankind. And if the Buddhists did, it was because it wasn't a religion but a wisdom. It was because they denied God that they were able to have some semblance of humanity to them. All religions that have some sense of nobility and don't let anybody talk to you that the noble red man had a religion. It was superstition and death feeling and nothing else. The only religions that lived and are noble are the derivative and the children of Judaism. Is that not unique? Do all these uniquenesses not require that we deal with them, that we respond to them? <coughs> and how we work, how did this happen? If not divine, then what? If not from God, then how? Is it rational? Is the story irrational? When you say, how do you prove it? But it's a rational story. None of the others have a rational story. And how do you prove it? How do you make up such a story if it isn't true? How do you tell it? How do you propagate it? Look at the difference. All mankind Parents have to persuade their children that their religion is true. But among the Jews, the children have to say, well, maybe, perhaps, they've got to explain it away. We were there. We got the Torah on Mount Sinai. God spoke to us. We get, well, but maybe it was. No, I want this is the, the truth. I once spoke to some students and I said to them, you'll see, I said, there will be an article in the paper that will describe how some people came from the stars in a starship and with microphones and things appeared at Mount Sinai and gave the program. Sure enough, there was such an article in the paper. You know how the Torah was given? Star people came in a great big star ship and they spoke with microphones and to whom did they speak? Only to the Jewish people. You get pretty desperate when you tell stories like that. <laughs> Why do you get desperate? There's a story there. You've got to deal with it. You don't want to deal with it because if you don't, you're going to have to accept the truth. You're going to have to accept the responsibility. You're going to have to change your life. Nobody wants to change their life. They're comfortable. To have to face up to a reality is unpleasant. I'd rather explain it away. If I have to make up a starship, I'll make up a starship. I'll explain it away. Because it's unpleasant to have to face up to an actual God, because if he is, nothing else matters, you have to understand that. If God is, then that's all in all. There's nothing else that has significance. If God is, to relate to him is 
is the only meaningful thing that we can do as human beings because God is. That's the purpose, that's the goal, that's the justification, it's the meaning of existence. If God is, we're His. That means we got to think. It means we got to be moral. It means we got to make decisions. It means we got to be responsible. Who wants it? If I can get out of it. We're desperate. Desperate to get out of it. We don't want to hear it. Because it means we got to be different. We don't want to be different. But it's true. He said you got to be different. And you got to face up to the need to determine for yourself in all honesty. Is it true? Can you explain all these things away? Is it really reasonable that the Jew and the Jew alone have all these unique that the Jew and the Jew alone have all this which has to be explained away some way or another. And no other people ever had an equivalent. Is this reasonable? Is this rational? I would ask you in all honesty. Please, in all honesty, I want to ask you the following question. Is it rational not to believe in the divinity of the Torah? Let me tell the story. I was called by a, a psychiatrist in Baltimore. He called me up and he said, we have an organization of Jewish psychiatrists. This was a long time ago, and there were only men in that organization. And these Jewish psychiatrists met once a month, each time in the home of another one of the members of the group, where they had a cultural evening. And he said to me, you know, he said, I thought, why shouldn't we bring in some people from out there? But I'd like to present to the group, when they're in my house, and the next one was in his house, I'd like to present to them some Jewish presentation. Would you speak to us? I said, yes. Yeah. I came to speak to him. It was a, a, a winter night, quite cold. I came in, and uh, they were there with their wives. They came in. It was very nice, and I started speaking. And one of the psychiatrists, one of the big men there, said, Rabbi, I want you to stop talking. And there's no way that I can describe to you the sense of shock. <laughs> I and everybody there, I'm mean, just not done. He said, Rabbi, if you keep talking, I'm going to have to change the way I live, and I like the way I live. He said to me, and everybody said, no, 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 speak, speak. And I was so shocked that I did. He got up. And he took his coat and walked out and left his wife behind him. I finished speaking. And I went to his wife to ask her name. 